You may have heard this buzzword lately. There has been much talk in the field amongst believers and disbelievers of this upcoming science, specifically neurotransmitter testing and the treatment of addiction. So today we will explore the science behind neurotransmitter testing. I'm your host Suzanne and this is Bridgeway to Recovery. My guest today is Dr. Phil Henry, who is the Chief Science Officer of Neurogistics. Dr. Henry received his PhD in Counseling and Psychology from Temple University in Philadelphia. He is a licensed psychologist and in his practice utilizes a holistic approach that includes counseling, neurotransmitter testing, nutrition, neuroscience, and exercise. Welcome, Dr. Henry. Suzanne, nice to be here today. So great to have you. So neurotransmitter testing, it's the latest buzz. People are talking about it, but what is it? It's kind of like the iPad, actually. Oh. Well, the iPad is, uh, is pretty new in terms of, well, not real new, but it was a jump from the way we used to do things. I don't know if you remember the CDs it used to have. Yes. And we had tons of CDs, and I had piles of them, couldn't keep track of them. And then when we got the iPod and the iPad, it was a jump to doing things a completely different way. And I think that's what the neurotransmitter testing is. It's a way that we will probably do things in five or 10 years, and it's just beginning to happen. So what is a neurotransmitter in layman's terms? A neurotransmitters are the gas and the brakes of the brain. It's the way the brain works. So all of us have inside a uh, little engine that runs in our brain, and we all have brakes in our brain that slow things down. And usually addiction is uh, connected to either making the engine run really fast or making the brakes go on really hard. But most people have uh, either go too quick or too slow. So we're looking for balance. And the way we can do that sometimes is test the neurotransmitters, see whether we're going too quick or too slow, and sort of balance that out. So do people have an unlimited supply of neurotransmitters, or are there specific ones that affect the disease of addiction? Well, we all have different amounts. We actually get them from food, interestingly enough. All of our neurotransmitters are made from amino acids, mostly proteins, and they're in common foods that we eat. Um, our body breaks them down at a different rate, but we often have these imbalances for birth. And it's sad, I have to tell you, I talked to a family with a 16-year-old, she's cutting herself, she's crying in the shower. I think she's very low on serotonin. Serotonin is one of our main neurotransmitters. And you can have that imbalance, and people who feel that imbalance feel desperate, they feel sad, they may cut themselves or do other things because they're so low. And we don't, we haven't previously known how to test for that. And I think we're just beginning to do that, which is exciting to me because then you can help somebody and find out where they're low and get them to the So the place. old adage, we are what we eat, really is true? It is true in a simplistic way. Our bodies take those raw materials and make something out of them. So we have to start with the raw materials, but we all have, um, we all have parents, and those parents usually give us good things and bad. Sometimes they give us depression and anxiety, which we don't ask for necessarily. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or attention deficit. I have a little attention deficit disorder, and I didn't ask for it necessarily, but I got it passed down to me. Right. So I have that, and uh, those imbalances in the neurotransmitters actually set our mood and change our mood, and they're affected by how we eat and what we eat. But also, um, for some of us, it's a little more difficult just to eat. We'd have to eat tons and tons and tons of food in order, certain things in order to change certain so, things. So, I mean, as you're speaking, I mean, this could be revolutionary to the, to the field. I mean, this could have a huge impact on the industry and the nature of us helping people get better. I worked and researched uh, for uh, Clozerol and Respiradol, two drugs, uh, antipsychotic medications. I got a PhD in psychology. I have an MDiv in... Um, theology and I was been seeking really to how to help people and when I started doing the neurotransmitter testing I kind of just really got into it because I was very excited that now we might be able to help some people who I think before this we weren't able to help. So tell us how does the testing take place? What does it involve? Well the testing is actually pretty simple. Everything in your body, all your liquid in your body, everything goes through your kidneys. Okay. So all your neurotransmitters and everything go through the kidneys and so the excretion of those values tell you how your body is using it. Sort of like the exhaust on a car can tell you how much you're burning up, you know? Mm -hmm. It gives you some idea of the things that you're um, 
the way that you're burning. And from those values, we can extract sort of what you're using the most of, what you're using the least of, and then we can tune the engine a little bit. Wow. So this can be used for many things, not just addiction, as you said, ADHD, I depression. Have, I have somebody who actually is diagnosed with Alzheimer's and with dementia, and I have them on some precursors. These are not, the difference between herb supplements and, and some of these supplements are these supplements are actually um, neurotransmitters or they're precursors to neurotransmitters, which are chemicals in your body that actually make the neurotransmitters. And if you give them, you can make the neurotransmitters. So I have somebody actually with dementia who's functioning very well right now, given certain supplements. Now, it's not the supplements that do it. Right. It's knowing the target. I had a guy come in and he says, I'm tired of taking so many boop, uh, supplements. Right. <laughs> and so his wife is... Uh, interested in helping him. He has some form of dementia. And so she was just giving him, every time there was a study, she was giving him supplements. So he was taking like 30 some supplements. Wow. Like just, you know. Self-medicating. Blue, blueberry extract increases brain cells. So they give him blueberry extract. Okay, that's great. You know, ginkgo biloba, oh, that's great. Right. But when we did the testing on him, we found that some of the stuff he was taking was actually hurting him. When we narrowed in and gave him exactly what he needed, he quit drinking within a month got a part-time job, and a lot of his dementia symptoms went away. Wow. Now, how long does someone stay on the treatment, or do they take these supplements for life? How long a process well, is it? Well, if you build things up, you can actually take less, which is interesting. It's the opposite of drugs. Um, most people all know this, that if you're on an SSRI, Paxil, mm -hmm. Zoloft, any of those, one of the reasons why it may not work is you may not have any serotonin to to be released, to keep from being uptaked. Mm -hmm. And uh, the problem like, with that is, if it's like a bank account. If you don't have serotonin in the bank, you can't write a check for it. So you write a Paxil check for $500 and you only have 50 uh, 5-HTP or 50 of the serotonin in your, in, in, your, uh, in your bank. The problem with that is you can't take it out then. But if you build that up over time... You have something to withdraw from. You have something to withdraw from. And th that's sort of the holistic idea. Find out where you're low and build it up. And find out the things that are high. Bring them down a little so you have it tuned. How does this sort of treatment and philosophy and testing combine with counseling? Well, I think that it's like medication. I'm not opposed to medication. I think if you're having a heart attack, the time for eating well and exercising is probably passed. You should probably go to the hospital and, uh, you know, get yourself uh, some. So I don't think medication is bad. But the way it fits in with it, it allows the brain to calm down so that you can do the work of therapy. I would think it's like a computer. You have, a, you have your hardware and you have your software. Once you have the hardware fixed, you still have to put the software on there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it allows the person to slow down enough so that they're not so sad that they can't think or they're so, you know, usually when a person comes off of uh, different drugs, their adrenals go really high. What does that mean? Their heart races a lot. They're very anxious. Almost everybody who comes off medication is anxious. Mm -hmm. So you get the anxiety down, you get the depression down, well then the person can think. So it gives you a baseline so that then you can start to build skills and foundations upon there. Exactly. Because I think recovery is not about getting away from drugs. Recovery is about getting to life. Absolutely. It's a lifestyle, right? It's a lifestyle. So you're trying to, and this supports a foundation of, I can think clearly, I can sleep, I can eat. If I can do those things, then I can have a real life. And I can function and thrive, not just function, because no. many of them, you know, they feel as if they're functioning on the drug, um, but they can thrive, they can excel. Now, this is the saddest thing. Some people actually look better on the drug mm -hmm. than they do without the drug. So you tell them drugs are bad, and they go, uh-huh. Really? But they know that they're actually functioning better on the drug because they're so anxious that they can't yes. think, right? Mm -hmm. Well, they smoke pot, and what happens? It turns off your emotions, and now, oh my gosh, I can think, and I don't have anxiety, and I don't have panic. But you tell me that's bad. Right. That's a bad thing to do, and I, and I know, okay, that's bad. 
but I experienced panic and all these things. And, and that I, perhaps is one of the hardest things to lead someone into recovery from because they think like all the stuff you're telling me about doesn't feel so good compared to what I'm getting right, right. now. Right, they kind of go like, I don't know if you really know what you're talking right. about. You're telling me it's better, right. but from my experience, sure doesn't feel better. I can't sleep, I'm nervous, I'm hyper. So tell me about Neurogistics, the company. We have about two minutes left. Give us a quick, how does someone get in touch with Neurogistics? What can you do for them? Well, uh, Neurogistics, you can go to www.neurogistics.com. It's mm -hmm. N-E-U-R-O-G-I-S. T-I-C-S, Norogistics.com, and uh, you can order yourself a test. The test kits cost about $200. I'm, I'm excited about that because I know spec scans and some of the other things I've done with people are about $1,400 or $1,500, mm -hmm. which is pretty expensive for the average person. So about $199, you get the report back, and it has not only here's your levels, but here are the things you can do to balance that out, which I'm kind of excited by. I love hearing that. Well, Dr. Henry, thank you so much for bringing this service to our community. Um, thank you so much for the work you do in the research of the service, and um, thank you so much for all the help that you provide to people who feel like there may be no other option for help, so I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Henry has taught for the last 13 years in the graduate counseling program of Palm Beach Atlantic University. I'm your host, Suzanne, and this is Bridgeway to Recovery.